I offer these words in the name of the God who creates, redeems, and sustains us. As we observe the feast of Absalom Jones today, the first African-American person ordained an Episcopal priest and a figure whose icon will soon illuminate St. James's sanctuary. I want to begin by acknowledging that the stories we tell, the voices we listen to, and the images we lift up deeply matter. They have the power to shape the people we will become and the ways in which we will live our lives as followers of Christ. And so today we are blessed to recall Absalom Jones's life and legacy. It is our privilege and our responsibility to consider what it means for this community to claim him as a special witness in our midst. It also feels fitting to remember Absalom Jones at this historical moment. He is someone who also lived through unprecedented times. Jones weathered his own experience of political turmoil, racial injustice, and yes, even a catastrophic plague with an abiding commitment to honoring the dignity of every human life. This commitment was surely nurtured by his deep faith, grounded in knowledge of the freedom that he achieved in belonging to Christ long before he was materially released from bondage. In Absalom Jones, we see a person who truly embodied the words of John's gospel, someone who loved others as God loved him and who exhibited sacrificial care throughout the entire course of his ministry. Absalom Jones was born into slavery in Sussex, Delaware in 1746. In his own biographical notes, Jones speaks of his early desire to learn to read and write. He saved what little money he was given to buy a primer and learned to read from studying the New Testament. When he was 16, Jones's owner sold his mother and siblings and moved to Philadelphia where Jones was put to work in his shop. We can only imagine what it must have been like to live in Philadelphia at this pivotal time. The city was a center of revolutionary activity and Absalom Jones must have been influenced by the ideas about freedom and self-determination that filled the air. Even while he worked long hours, Jones continued to pursue his education by attending night school. He married Mary Thomas, a woman who was also enslaved in 1770. Absalom Jones purchased his wife's freedom early in their marriage and worked late into the night to earn income that he would use to purchase a house and some land. Even so, he would not achieve his own manumission until 1784. By this time, Jones had found a spiritual home at St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church, where he began a lifelong friendship with Richard Allen, who would go on to found the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Both men served as preachers and pastoral leaders to St. George's Black community, which grew significantly because of their ministries. Even as Absalom Jones achieved his own material success and earned a place of respect in Philadelphia society, he never lost sight of those closest to the margins. Jones possessed immense spiritual depth, yes, but he also knew how to organize. Seeing an increased need for services among the growing community, of recently emancipated people in Philadelphia, Jones and Allen were instrumental in establishing the Free African Society, quite possibly the first independent Black institution in the United States. In addition to supporting widows, orphans, and those in need, the society was an important place for Black Philadelphians to develop leaders, advocate for change, and form a vision of what a society free from slavery could look like. Religious belief and social activism were never far apart in the society. Conversations about establishing an independent black church began in this organization. The need for such a church became even more apparent in 1792. At St. George's, the growing black congregation provided funding and labor to expand the church building. As is so often the case though, white anxiety rose right alongside black participation. And when the new gallery was completed, Black worshipers were forced up from their prayers and told to move to a segregated section. Jones and Allen responded by leading a walkout of St. George's Black congregants. It is possible this experience influenced the decision to join the Episcopal Church rather than the Methodists, 
when choosing the denominational affiliation that would allow the independent congregation official status as a church. The newly formed St. Thomas African Episcopal Church applied to the Diocese of Pennsylvania with three conditions. That they be recognized as an organized body, that they have control over their own affairs, and that Absalom Jones be licensed as a lay reader and, if appropriate, ordained a priest. While the diocese agreed to those conditions, they still fell short of affording St. Thomas the same rights given to white churches. It would be 70 years before St. Thomas was accorded a voice in the Diocese of Pennsylvania's convention. Absalom Jones himself was ordained a deacon in 1795, but the church made him wait a further seven years before ordaining him as a priest, during which time he served St. Thomas as rector in all but name. In fact, when St. Thomas's building was completed, the first sermon was preached by a white priest who exhorted the gathered congregation to show sufficient gratitude for the white Philadelphians who contributed to the building and resist any feelings of pride in what they had accomplished. Jones and several other leaders penned their own document, the causes and motives for establishing St. Thomas's African church a week later. They stated that in forming their congregation, God had provided opportunity for its members to arise out of the dust and shake ourselves and throw off that servile fear that the habit of oppression and bondage trained us up in. In this language, we can see Jones and his community asserting that St. Thomas's was in fact a place where people could boldly reclaim the dignity denied to them by society at large. In subsequent years, Jones would preach numerous sermons advocating for the abolition of slavery from St. Thomas's pulpit and the church would expand their educational and social service offerings to the wider community. While the walkout at St. George's and the founding of St. Thomas's are two of the events Absalom Jones is most known for, I want to highlight one other moment from his life that resonates strongly today. In the summer of 1793, yellow fever struck the city of Philadelphia. Over the course of three months, one tenth of the city's res residents died and another third fled. One can only imagine the devastation, chaos and dread that would have taken over. As in our own pandemic context, black people were the essential workers of 1793 Philadelphia. In a situation that we have seen repeated all too often throughout history, the medical establishment made the erroneous assumption that black people could not catch the fever and Jones and Allen were asked to recruit volunteers to nurse the sick and bury the dead. Although it quickly became apparent that all were susceptible to this disease, Black people still provided care to the white victims of the yellow fever with minimal compensation and at great personal risk. Following the outbreak, Philadelphia's Black community received very little thanks, and in some instances were blamed for the disease's spread. Here again, we can see a disturbing parallel to the recent increase in hate crimes committed against Asian people because of prejudice and misinformation about COVID-19. In the wake of the yellow fever, a prominent Philadelphia publisher distributed pamphlets accusing poor black people of stealing from homes and extorting fees for nursing and burials. Jones and Allen published their own response, highlighting the sacrificial actions of Philadelphia's poor black community detailing how they suffered and died, caring for people who would not have shown them respect or friendship under normal circumstances. This narrative of the proceedings of the Black people during the late awful calamity in Philadelphia is powerful reading, and I commend it to all of you. As I read through the horrifying firsthand account of the 1793 pandemic, and as I reflected on the broader arc of Absalom Jones's story, I kept returning to the fact that I, like most white people, have lived my life benefiting from and remaining complicit in a social system that largely affirms my human dignity without question. In the life and witness of Absalom Jones, however, we see a person who had to claim his own dignity and assert it every moment of his life in achieving his personal freedom, in following his vocation in the church, and in working for the common good of society. I, of all people, cannot claim to speak for Absalom Jones, but in reading about the consistent care he showed for his fellow humans, 
and the energy that he poured into creating spaces where even the most disenfranchised could find opportunity to flourish. I think it is clear that Absalom Jones did not tie his own value or the value of any other person to their place in our broken social system. Rather, he continued to show us how transformative it can be when the self-emptying love proclaimed in today's gospel reading sits at the very heart of a person's life. And so, while it is good and right to celebrate the legacy of Absalom Jones in our Episcopal Church, we cannot truly claim to honor him without allowing the love he displayed to call us to account. Absalom Jones devoted himself to the building up of a beloved community, and this work remains unperfected more than two centuries after his death. If this past year has shown us anything, it is that our American society still remains mired in the sins of racism and economic injustice, still burdened by the lingering oppression of the system of slavery that Absalom Jones spent his life working to abolish. Many of those who sow with tears are not yet able to reap with songs of joy. And so my friends, as we enter this Lenten season of self-reflection, repentance and preparation, perhaps we are called to look more deeply inside ourselves, to examine the kind of love we display in our own lives and communities, to look closely at the places where we have failed to establish relationships of true friendship and care. What would it look like for us to love like Absalom Jones, to love in a way that can begin, even in some small part, to change the world? Amen. <laughs>